I welcome each one of you, my fellow pilgrims to heaven, for our weekly Bible study. This is the seventh Sabbath school lesson study. God is so gracious to us, so we want to praise God. Before we pray and begin the lesson study, we also need to pray for our nation. We are going to celebrate the Independence Day in a few days from now, that is on August 15th. So we want to pray for all of our national leaders, all of our state leaders, all of our district leaders, all of our town and city leaders, all of our village leaders, wherever you live, pray for them because we are told by God. In 1 Timothy, Paul instructs, 1 Timothy chapter 2, first four verses, saying, pray for your rulers, pray for those who have authority over you, pray for your kings. Surely, though they may not be believers, most of them are not believers, yet we have the responsibility to pray for them because of their ruling. We have peace and our families can live in peace. That's why it's our duty to pray for our nation so that we will continue to have this freedom of worship and also people can improve and develop and will have prosperity. Along with that, we can also plead with the Lord. There are so many clouds of uh, challenges for the ministry in some parts of India. Pray that God will grant that blessing for each one of us so that we will continue to have this policy to have freedom of worship. We need to pray for uh, all of that. And also there is a little concern again that a new form of uh, coronavirus is again spreading in uh, UK and also some news reports are suggesting it already entered into India. We need to pray for God's mercy so that this new variant of coronavirus will not spread, it will not cause any more harm and uh, death to people. We need to pray for that. Let's pray before we begin. Loving Father, we want to thank you for your son Jesus and his supreme sacrifice and the provision of salvation which we have through Jesus Christ. We want to praise you. Also, we want to pray for our nation. God bless all of our national leaders, bless all of our states and the state leaders, and bless our districts and district leaders, bless all of our cities and towns and their leadership, and also villages and their leadership in the villages. Bless them, Lord, irrespective of their political affiliations, but bless them so that they can rule this nation and rule the area where they have authority with peace and also honesty. Lord, we need your special blessing and eradicate all the problems what we face in this nation, poverty and also violence in some places. Lord, we need your special grace, also your protection from the, again, a new variant of coronavirus. Lord, we want you to eliminate that one for your glory and honor so that all of us can be in safety. Continue to glorify your name. Bless us to understand Ephesians chapter 4 and fill us with your spirit so that we can understand these deeper implications of your truth presented in this chapter 4. Four. Thank you, Jesus. Bless all of those who are helping us to share this link and also share our YouTube and share these thoughts with their local congregations and also their family members and friends. Bless them because I pray in Jesus' loving name. Amen. My brothers and sisters, the seventh Sabbath school lesson study. The title is Unified Body of Christ. Unified body of Christ. What is this unified body of Christ? It is referring to church. Church is the body of Christ. A memory text comes from Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12. We'll come to that in a short while from now. In this seventh lesson, we are going to study together Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 to 16, Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 16. Paul gives us, in verse 16 onwards, an example of the body, human body. 
and he says, leg cannot argue and say, I am greater because I am carrying all the body. Or I cannot say, I am the one who is watching and who is giving you safety. I am more important. Hand cannot say, I am doing everything, so I am important. So, no organ in the body can say, I am more important than others. Likewise, in the body, all of us know in the organs, even that little finger on our hand or that little toe on our foot is equally important because God has made us. That's why every little organ also has its important role to play. Likewise, Paul is giving this example saying, church is the body of Jesus Christ. In the church, everyone is important. Rich people, poor people. Educated people, uneducated people. Or sometimes we say in India, high caste and the low caste. But in Christ, we don't have such kind of separation. But still, there are people who think that way. And also, big tribe, small tribe. Everyone... When it comes to church, when it comes to salvation, they're all equal. They're all equal. Everyone has an important role to play in the church. That's why the zeal of Paul in these 16 verses of chapter 4 is church and its unity. Church and its unity. My brother, my sister, is there unity in the church where you worship? in that village or in that town or in that city, wherever it is, is there unity. Often that unity is lacking. It was there in the first century AD, Paul noticed that. So under inspiration, he wrote these verses. And also, we also see it more and more in this ending of the end time. Unity is lacking. We come to the memory text. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. And God has given some that gift of being apostles. So he made some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, some as teachers. What for all of this? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. All of these gifts, gifts of the Spirit, all of these gifts are due to the Holy Spirit. But what is the purpose for all of these gifts, different gifts in the church? It is for the perfecting of saints. That is, each believer must reach perfection in Jesus. It is for the ministry. It is for the edifying of the body of Jesus Christ. Till we the members of God's family, till we come into the unity in Christ. So through Jesus, in Jesus we need to have that unity. That's why as we are coming to the end of the end time, that unity is lacking. Satan is dividing us in the name of languages. In the city churches, town churches, different language people. They are divided because of their language. They don't get along with other language people. But in Christ, all of us are one as brothers and sisters, loving brothers and sisters. We are one. We are united. Do we have that one? And some places, they are divided because of their caste, because of their tribe, because of their economic background, rich and poor. They are divided. But Paul says, that should not be there in the church. Church, all are equal. We should be united in Jesus because Jesus died for us. That's why that unity comes in the church because of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, whom Jesus said, I'll send you the comforter. He'll teach you all things. The Holy Spirit is working vigorously on the earth for the salvation of each one of us, for the edification of the church, for each one of us to grow into the likeness of Jesus. That's why Paul is emphasizing to nurture the church, church nurturing. We read in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 saying, Paul is talking about, I am the prisoner of Christ. Yes, 
for Jesus Christ, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, he was in the prison. Otherwise, there was no reason for him to be in the prison. He did not do anything wrong. He did not steal. He did not uh, murder anyone. He did not commit adultery. He did not do any anti-social activities. Just because he believed in Jesus and actively he was preaching and also leading people to Christ and salvation. He was in crime. He was in the prison. That's why he says, I'm the prisoner of Jesus Christ. But he says, my brothers and sisters, he says, walk according to the calling, worthy of your calling. What is the calling? Jesus called each one of us to be his sons and daughters. Jesus called each one of us to be saved. Jesus called each one of us to inherit eternal life. But do we live according to the calling, worthy of his calling? That is, do we behave as the sons and daughters of Jesus? Do we have that humility in our dress, in our words, in our songs, our day-to-day -day behavior? Can people see Jesus in us? Can our colleagues, can our people, the, our neighbors, can they say, oh, these are Christians, these are faithful people, these are good people. Do they say that? Or do we live lives which has no difference between Christians and non-Christians, Christians and heathen people. Do we live that way in our behavior, in our dressing, in everything what we do? That's why we need to learn this important lesson. And Paul is advising in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1, we must, God's people must have meekness, long-suffering, because God has long-suffering. As his sons and daughters, we should have long-suffering which means we should not react quickly for anything what others may say about us. We should have long-suffering attribute and also that meekness, that humility and also forgiveness from time to time. Yes, as human beings, some disagreement may come, some kind of harsh words against each other. But we are willing to, we should have that willingness to forgive each other. Jesus forgave those people and he said father forgive them they don't know what they do they were crucifying him still he prayed and we need to have that kind of uh, attribute that kind of attitude to forgive our brothers and sisters in the church our fellow believers and also we need to have humility gentleness and patience these three are very important humility but means humbling ourselves but humility should not be taken as weakness in us. Humility in Jesus Christ is a strength in Jesus Christ. In, humility is a strength in Jesus Christ. It's because of Jesus we have that strength of humbling ourselves. How great you may be, how big job you may have, how much big salary you may have, how much of social status you may have, how much of a latest costly vehicle you may have, but still, do you humble yourself in the Lord? Do you humble yourself to help others who are in need? Not only the believers, even the non-believers. When you have humility, we can go out to help others. We can show that love in our life to us. We can show Christ's love to others through our lives. But often we face a problem, especially when you come together to worship the Lord and our Sabbath school lesson study. Many times that Sabbath school lesson study in some places, some churches, it becomes like a small battleground because as human beings, there are sometimes two groups in the church, three groups in the church. So one person who belong to one group is teaching the Sabbath school lesson. The other group members, somehow they want to ridicule them. Somehow they want to put them down. Somehow they want to kind of mock them. So they ask some tough questions. That question may not be relevant at all to that lesson study for that week. But still they ask that question. Question like, uh, God knows everything. God knows that Lucifer is going to become Saturn one day. Why did God create that Lucifer? 
or sometimes they may ask that other question and say god knows everything so god knows that uh, this tree of knowledge if it is there and one day adam and eve will eat it because god knows everything past present and future then why did god put that tree if he did not put that tree this problem of sin would not have been there some question some hard question people want to put that one in order to just mock that teacher i know there are places because of this heated argument and sometimes when some somebody is teaching the other group member will say what you are saying is wrong what you are saying is wrong it is not right in front of everybody the person who teaches gets so much embarrassed and sometimes there are situations the person who is teaching they cry and they come to worship with the spirit and to receive god's blessing but because of this heated exchanges in the sabbath school lesson study and they become bitter sometimes they leave the church some of those people i heard because of that heated exchanges bitter argument in the sabbath school lesson study they stopped coming to the church my brother my sister do you also do that did you also suffer that way in your church if you have that humility suppose whoever is teaching if they are teaching something wrong instead of saying what you are teaching is wrong then you can read a verse from the bible and say what is your opinion on this verse what do you say about this one can you because it is related to what you are saying sure that person will be able to realize that's why instead of condemning them directly you are wrong in front of everybody to embarrass in that embarrassment that person may stop coming to the church that's why let our sabbath school lesson classes not become a small battle ground rather it should be a place where we can study deeper learn more what we do not know it should be the attempt that's why if you have that humility we will not have any problem if you have that meekness we will not have anything that's why if you have that humility and meekness even if somebody is provoking you with some if somebody is provoking you with some tough question irrelevant question or if somebody is uh, provoking you by blaming you for something in the church what you did not involve or what it what you did not do it or you have no involvement in that wrong thing in the church but they may blame you so but if you have humility and meekness like jesus instead of quarreling with them we may pray for them so that that person will realize later and say yes i have done this one wrong so such humility and meekness it within us will bring unity in the church unity in the church and also we read in ephesians chapter 4 verses 4 5 and 6 those three verses paul mentions seven important aspects seven are very unique there is nothing which can be compared with them first one one body is talking about one church any church every church must be the church of jesus christ because it's because of jesus and his supreme sacrifice we have the church because church is god's agency to take the salvation to the people that's why only one church yes there are so many denominations with different names like lutheran baptist pentecostal anglican or oh, you name so many denominations there are also some independent churches they have some name like jerusalem church bethany church bethlehem church galilee church zion church or oh, so many names they want to have whatever the name but the church must be centered around jesus that's only one church but there are some churches which are rejecting jesus as the son of god they don't accept jesus as god but still they say we are christians still they say ours is church if any church any denomination any person rejecting jesus as god that person 
has no right to call himself or herself as Christian. And that church which doesn't believe in Jesus as the Savior, the church which doesn't say that Jesus is God, if they don't believe that Jesus is God, that church has no right to be called as Christian church. Yes, there are churches like that. They reject Jesus Christ. They don't accept Jesus as God. And also, we need to be careful in this. That's why one church, the second point which says one spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, there is nobody equal to him or above him. One spirit. Third one, one hope, our hope, only one hope in Christ, one hope for salvation. The fourth one, one Lord, that is Jesus Christ, one Lord. Fifth one, one faith, that faith is in Jesus, only one faith. Then sixth one, one baptism. Yes, in the days of Paul, there was only one baptism. But unfortunately, today Satan brought into the church sprinkling baptism. Some major churches practice it. And also, there is a church which uh, says if they walk under the flag, they have the flag of cross, then they say the person who walks under that one, they say that is baptism. So, any other things which are not mentioned in the Bible, there is only one baptism. That baptism is for the forgiveness of sin in the name of Jesus and baptism in the water, that is immersion baptism. The Greek word baptizo means to dip somebody under water. That's only the baptism. In fact, Jesus Christ set an example for each one of us by taking baptism in the water of Jordan River. That's why only one baptism. Seventh one, one father, that is God the Father, one. So all of these seven aspects, one body, that is church, one church, one spirit, that is Holy Spirit, one hope, that is hope for salvation, one Lord, that is Jesus Christ, one faith, that is only faith in Jesus, one baptism, that is in the name of Jesus, immersion baptism, one God the Father. So Paul is emphasizing all of this one. But also we have to notice, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 10 says that God is filled in all. But that should not be understood as pantheism. That God is not in the trees and the animals and the mountains. Sure, that kind of teaching is there in the heathen religions. That's why they worship a tree, they worship stone, they worship mountain, they worship river, they worship animals and birds because they think God is there in everything. We don't believe that. But when it says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 10, he fills all, which means everything is created by him. Everything is created by him. Everything came into existence because of him. That's why he fills all. And also his presence is there everywhere in the universe. But these created objects or created beings should not be worshipped. We should not even worship angels. That's why we need to understand this important point. And also the exalted Jesus exalted Jesus is giving gifts. What are those gifts? Exalted Christ. When we say exalted Christ after his death, resurrection and ascension, this is what we call exalted Christ. We read that one in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 to 10 verses. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 to 10 verses. And all of us know Christ, he is God and he sits on the throne. Angels Worship him, saying, holy, holy, holy. Such a God. He left every privilege of heaven. He left everything. And he came down to this earth as a human being in order to save us, in order to die for us. That's why Christ descended first to this earth as an ordinary poor human being. All of us know that one. Then he died, resurrected as he told. He foretold that when I'm going to resurrect on the third day. He resurrected on the third day. Then he appeared to people for 40 days. 
and also then he ascended to heaven. But after his resurrection, we need to understand this important point also. Right after the resurrection, that morning itself, resurrection morning, Jesus went to heaven to present himself to the Father. We read that one. We read in Matthew chapter 27, verse 52 and 53. On the morning when Jesus resurrected, that is the first day of the week, there was a big earthquake. And Jesus was the first one to resurrect that morning. But after Jesus' resurrection, within a few moments after his resurrection, a number of saints from the Old Testament, how many we are not told, their names we are not told, but a number of saints who lived and died during the Old Testament time, they were buried, they became mud for many years. For example, somebody like Methuselah, somebody like Noah, somebody like Prophet Daniel, so many of those faithful people or father of faith, Abraham, they all lived and died in faith. But some of those people, a number of those people resurrected with immortal bodies. And we read in Matthew chapter 27, verse 53, they went into the holy city, that is Jerusalem city, and appeared to so many people. And they told, Jesus resurrected, and he resurrected us. By looking at them, their immortal bodies, and their uh, immortal dress, that is the white dress, which all the immortal people or immortal bodies heavenly beings wear and they can see these people so tall and also immortal look that glory on their faces and they could recognize they did not know who it was like they could not uh, see personally uh, the name of each person but they saw and they witnessed after that we don't have any account what happened to those resurrected saints. We don't have any discussion about them. But here in this chapter, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, Paul says, he took the captives as captive into heaven and gave to God the Father gifts on behalf of human beings. He took the captives as captive, which means those people in the Old Testament times, the saints also, they were captured by death. So they became victims of death. But what happened later? And what happened to those uh, people who were captured by death? That means who died a natural death. Adam died when he was 930 years old. Methuselah died when he was 969 years old. Abraham died when he was 175 years old. People died. But in faith... Such people, we do not know their name, just I am only giving examples so that we can understand. They were resurrected with a mortal body. Then, where did they go? Here Paul says, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8, He took those captives who were captured by death, He resurrected them, took them with Him to heaven that morning. How do you know that He took them in the morning? He went in the morning to heaven. We read in John chapter 20, Verse 16, that early morning when Jesus resurrected, it was still semi-dark, twilight what we call. Mary Magdalene was there and she was so much baffled. She looked at the open tomb and she saw somebody walking. She thought he was a gardener and he said, please tell me where you took and kept that body of Jesus Christ. I will take it secretly. I will not tell anyone. In her enthusiasm and also in her sorrow, she wanted to take the dead body. But realizing that she is not able to recognize him because still it was semi-dark. And Jesus called her Mary. The moment Jesus mentioned her name Mary, she recognized his voice in that semi-darkness also. And immediately she was bowing down to touch his feet to worship him. And Jesus said, don't touch me. I have not ascended to the Father yet. Don't touch me. Then, he also told, I'm going to, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father. Tell my disciples I'm going to meet them in Galilee. And also, whole day, 
Jesus did not appear to anyone. Where did he go? Because he told himself in his own words, I am ascending to the Father. My Father and your Father. You can read that in John chapter 20 verse 16 onwards. As he told, he went to the Father. And on that day, when Jesus resurrected, that day was a, a small festival. The festival of first fruits. All of us know Jesus died on the festival of Passover. Passover comes even now, according to Jewish calendar, on their first month. First month of Jewish people is known as Nisan. And Nisan 14th, Nisan 14th, the first month of Jewish people, is Passover festival. The following day, 15th day, is unleavened bread. That also major festival. Then third day, a small festival called first fruits. So whatever grows in their farm, they have to first bring to the sanctuary and wave it before the Lord. That's why it's called wave sheaf. Usually that 16th day, it comes, Nisan month comes in between March and April according to our calendar. Which means in April, the barley and the wheat crop is ready for harvest and also some fruits. Whatever is ready, they have to bring and wave it before the Lord. Of course, priest does it. Then they can harvesting their crop. They can start eating. So, first fruits they have to bring to the sanctuary. Likewise, on the day of first fruits, Jesus resurrected. And also, he resurrected all of the saints. He took them as first fruits from this earth to heaven to present them to the Father as the first fruits from the dead. We need to understand this important truth. That's why Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8 is very, very important for us. So he gave gifts unto the Lord on behalf of each one of us. And also, all of us know, after that, Evening, he came back that same day of resurrection day. And towards the evening, two men, faithful men, were walking from Jerusalem to their village, Emmaus. And Jesus met them as though he was also just going to some other village, a passerby, a passenger like. Then he met them. They were talking about his death. They could not recognize that he was Christ. And when they reached their uh, village, Emmaus, it was almost getting dark. In graciousness, they said, it is dangerous to travel in the night. And they did not ask which village, what is your address. They did not ask anything. Please come home. We'll give you food. You eat food. And you sleep tonight in our house. Tomorrow morning you can go. So gracious. They did not know who it was. As soon as he entered, they set food before him. And as usual, before eating food, he prayed. Then their eyes were open. They could recognize, oh, he's Jesus, Jesus, they said. That's why whole day he did not appear to anyone. Only evening he appeared, which means whole day he was in heaven because he took those resurrected people, presented them to God the Father as the first fruits. Later, when he met Thomas, one week later, then he said, put your finger in my wounds and see. He allowed him to touch. That's why definitely Jesus took them on that day, resurrected saints to heaven. Out of them, God chose 24 elders. How many taken, we do not know. Out of them, God chose 24 elders. We read about them. In 24 elders are human beings taken by Jesus at his resurrection on that resurrection day. And also, 40 days later, he appeared to many people. And after 40 days, he ascended to heaven from Mount Olives. After 10 days of his ascension was the day of or festival of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, Jesus started functioning as our mediator. Jesus started functioning as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, the holy place, first apartment. He started functioning. And as a result, to show that he started functioning, as our high priest, as our mediator, Christ sent the Holy Spirit as he promised. We read that when Acts chapter 2, all the disciples were filled by the power of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Peter preached one sermon, 3,000 people were converted. 
that was the sign of Christ started functioning as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, the holy place. In order for the church, which means church was organized officially on the day of Pentecost. Yes, when Jesus was here, he preached and so many were converted. Surely they were there. But as human beings, the apostles began to do his ministry, what he told. First preach in Jerusalem, then Judea, then go to the uttermost parts of the world. They started. So the church was officially organized. The planting work, let us say, the planting work, planting of the church started in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people that day. In order for the church to grow, in order for the gospel to reach to the ends of the earth, in order for the believers, whom we call saints, to be perfected, in order for the church to be in unity, Jesus gave special gifts. What are those special gifts? That's what is our memory text. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Some, he used them as apostles. Some. Some people he used as prophets. Some he used as evangelists. Who is an evangelist? Who goes place to place, not staying in any one place like Paul. He went to so many places, so many cities to preach. He stayed for a few days, maybe a few weeks, maybe a few months, organized the church. Then he moved on to another place, another town, another place. So that person is an evangelist. Then who is the pastor? Pastor is someone who stays in one place, one village or one city and takes care of the believers. He's the pastor. He's the shepherd of that congregation. Then teacher. Now, basically, the teacher is teaching God's word, teaching the Bible. It is referring to. I know some people also take this one and say those who are in teaching profession. They are uh, teachers in uh, some elementary school, high school, or some college, they are teachers. They say, yes, here is the teaching profession mentioned. But that may be a secondary meaning. But the basic meaning, fundamental understanding meaning is teaching God's word. So these are all for what? For the edification of the church, for the perfecting of the saints, and for the unity, so that all of us, the believers, can reach into the maturity of Jesus Christ so that we can be united. Surely in our church, God used Ellen White as the prophetess in 1844 December. She received the prophetic gift. But we are told in, Isaac, we are told in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, in the last days, he will pour out his spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old people will see dreams and others will prophesy. Surely the prophetic gift is not limited to only Ellen White, but many people, whomever, Wherever it is needed, God will choose somebody to be a prophet for that area in these last days. But in spite of giving us this prophetic gift, what is our spiritual condition? Our spiritual condition is like Laodicean church, lukewarm. That's why God is telling Isaiah chapter 5 verse 4. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 4. He says, what more could I do for my vineyard? He did everything. Still, we are not perfect. We are not united. I know there are many places our members also divided because of their skin color, black and white. They are divided because of their social status. They are divided because of their caste. They are divided because of their tribe. They cannot worship together. They are not worshiping together. That's why we need to come into the likeness of Jesus, to grow in Jesus, to come into the unity. But we need to also consider some dangers threatening the body of Christ in order to mature. There are many doctrinal differences. That doctrines are like the wind, the wind, strong wind. Strong wind blows away everything. Like that there are many unbiblical wrong teachings are entering into the church. For example, the Church of Almighty God, which is spreading more in China 
and in the borders of Arunachal Pradesh and all. Church of Almighty God. They say, they teach openly that Jesus Christ is a woman, not man. He is going to come back as a woman. He was also on this earth as a woman. See what a blasphemy. What a blasphemy, which is not in the Bible, but they are spreading. It's not in hundreds. Thousands of people are the followers of this Almighty Church of God. That's why Paul is giving this warning. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 and 15. Don't be tossed by the wind of unbiblical teaching. There's false teachers. We should not. Christ is our anchor. The word of God, the Bible is our only source for our faith, for our doctrine, for our belief. That's why any cunning, trickery words and also there are people in our church also, they believe once you are saved, always saved. All will be saved, almost like a universal salvation. Nobody will be lost. If they accept Jesus as the savior, no matter what you do, no matter what they eat, no matter what they drink, no matter uh, how they live on this earth, they will be saved. People are believing that that is wrong. It is not in the Bible. It is not like once saved, always saved. That is not in the Bible. So that's why we need to be careful of these different wrong teachings, unbiblical teachings. But they are in the church and they are taught by the elders and the preachers also. Some of our churches is very sad. And also there are people who are teaching and believing that there is going to be seven years of tribulation, which is not in the Bible again. Where it is found, they are not able to show anywhere in the Bible. But still they believe seven years of tribulation on this earth. Antichrist is going to control this world and rule. Some of these things. And also another dangerous doctrine entered into the church in the recent times. That is, there are people, uh, some of our pastors, some of our elders, they are preaching. They are putting on the YouTube also saying, Jesus is going to come back second time in AD 2031. 2031 he is going to come back. Why? Their reasoning is by 2031, that will be 2000 years completed because Jesus died in 31 AD, resurrected and went back to heaven. By 2031, 2000 years will be completed. They are thinking that will be the end of the world. Now, chances are Christ can come before or if needed in his own uh, way because Jesus told clearly, Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, no one knows the day or the hour of his coming, not even the angels. But some of these people have a nice chart and some of the nice events. This is, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. Jesus is going to come. They're putting that uh, kind of a chart of dates. And also some people also are saying that they're believing, they're teaching. And uh, out of their enthusiasm, uh, they are printing some uh, little, little booklets and uh, distributing so many places and also making some video and sending everywhere, saying that Jesus is going to come in 2025. Some say 2027. They have different uh, dates. Now, we learned with a very bitter experience, date setting should not be there. Our pioneers in 1844, they fixed the date. It was a bitter disappointment. They did not learn the lesson. Jesus told clearly, no one knows the day or the hour of his coming. Not even the angels. These people who are setting the dates, whether it is uh, 2031 or whether it is 2025, whether it is 2027, are they better than angels? Who is better than angels? Who is above angels? Only God. Some of these people almost like becoming God looks like. That's why we should be very careful, my brothers and sisters. This type of Confusion Satan is bringing in, in the churches. That's why our anchor is only Jesus. We should not be tossed in this wind of doctrines, unbiblical doctrines. Let us trust in Jesus. Let us trust in Jesus. Let us follow the light of the Bible. Let us follow the light of the Ten Commandments. So we will be safe and we will be united together. May the Lord bless each one of us so that we can live as sons and daughters of Jesus because he called us to be his sons and daughters. He called us to represent him in these last days to spread the gospel. And we have to live according to 
that calling. We have to live as worthy people for that calling of God. If that is your decision today, and join me, and I'll pray and conclude this lesson study. Loving Father, we want to thank you for helping us to understand. Help us not to be deceived, tossed by any unbiblical teaching. Bless us to trust in Jesus and also take Jesus as our anchor so that we will follow the light of the Bible and the light of the Ten Commandments so that we can bring glory and honor to you because we have to live a worthy life for the calling which you have called us to be your sons and daughters in this ending of the end time. Bless all of those who are sharing this link, sharing this video with others and bless them as they share some of these thoughts with their Bless them as they share some of these thoughts with their congregation and others. Bless each one of us to grow in you because I pray in Jesus' loving name. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. Share this link and share our YouTube, Professor Sharath Baba with others so that they can also be blessed and uh, continue to uphold me and uh, these young people who are assisting me for this humble ministry so that God's name will be glorified. And if it is God's will, we will meet you again in the eighth lesson next week. God be with you. God bless you.